Welcome to the Team Engagement Podcast, where leaders of teams share their insights. Brought to you by Blue Sky Business Consulting. We discuss five questions in about 15 minutes. Hello again, everyone. Glad that you have chosen to join us again for the Team Engagement Podcast. And I'm also very excited to welcome our guest. This is Dr. Randy Ross. He is the founder and CEO of Remarkable. And he is from the great state of Georgia, more specifically the Atlanta area. So Dr. Randy, thank you so much for taking time to join me on the podcast today. And before we get started with our questions, what would you like the audience to know about Remarkable and some of the projects that you're working on? Well, Sean, thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you first. And uh, and secondly, I appreciate you asking the question. I am an author and a speaker. Uh, I travel the country uh, imparting principles and truths to help organizations kind of elevate their productivity and their collaboration. Uh, I've written several books about leadership, culture, uh, employee experience, customer service, all that kind of good stuff. And so it's uh, it's a privilege to be able to uh, share what we call transformative truth with our audiences that will improve their lives, both personally and professionally. That's great. And it's very, very much needed in all of our organizations, large or small. So thank you for the work that you're doing there. Okay, well, let's get started with our questions then. Now, Dr. Randy, as a business leader, how does a, a leader know when to pivot in the business? Well, I think that's probably a, one of the most crucial questions you could ask because we all come to those places that we have to make the determination. Do we continue to pursue this objective or do we abandon it for something else? And I think uh, that's a big part of understanding resilience. Mm. Uh, you and I were talking a little earlier. I wrote a book. Right. Right? COVID called Fireproof Happiness. And in that book, we talk about the buoyancy beliefs, those things that you need to embrace in order to keep your head above water when the storm water surge. And there are four practical principles, positivity, believing that my tomorrow can be better than today. The uh, responsibility, which says I'm not a victim. I have a say in how my life unfolds. And the last two apply to what you're asking about. The third is agility. Mm -hmm. There's not just one way to get to any desired destination. And the last one is reality. You have to embrace your reality. So pivoting has to do with the last two, agility and reality. Uh, agility just simply is the wisdom to know when it's too costly to continue to pursue one particular desired destination. It may cost you too much emotionally. It may cost you too much financially. And I think sometimes people... Uh, uh, want to persevere to their own demise. Mm -hmm. In other words, they have to uh, they have to combine both agility and responsibility and reality to make good determinations. It's that blend between knowing that in the end you will persevere and come out on the other side victorious, but the discipline to embrace the totality of reality, no matter how harsh it may be. And so if you want practical insights, take that a little bit further, pick up a copy of the book and it'll help you do that. Oh, that's great information and great points about balancing and blending all of those things together, because I'm sure we all have it when you're in leadership consulting, like you and I are, we have leaders that sometimes get very stuck, stubborn, whatever it is, and they get really locked in. And if they would embrace what you're talking about and blend in all of these different principles, it'll help them make better decisions. And then they won't uh, run into their own demise, as you put it. So that's very good information. All right. Question number two, share with the audience one of your company's core values and then how that value helps you make decisions in the business. Well, one of our core values is a value that I don't see on too many uh boards, placards when you walk into many organizations, and that's health. Mm -hmm. And um, health, I mean, when we talk about health, foundational for productivity. I mean, we have to be healthy personally to bring our best self to the table. The organization has to be healthy. Um, but when I talk about health, what I'm really talking about is I'm talking about a commitment to make sure that what we do matches our values that we embrace, embody, and imbue our values, but then those values have their desired impact that they cause us to bring our best self to the table and also to be able to create an environment that's relationally rich because that's where people thrive. So we want to make sure that we're healthy emotionally. 
uh, that we have the internal fortitude to be able to stand the pressures that come at us externally. We want to make sure that we're relationally healthy. Uh, another book I wrote several years ago, ago called Relationomics, and it's the power of healthy relationships to drive good business because good business is built on healthy relationships. So you have to focus on the health of relationships. You have to focus on the health of the physically, uh, personally, and then financially, corporately. So health is a, is a value that we hold very, very dear. And the question we always ask is, does this align with our values? <laughs> and really right. cause us to be more healthy in the long run? Because I think that's central, essential, core to all that you do. I love that. And I love that you have uh, pointed out something that you're absolutely right. We don't talk about health as a value. And especially thanks to your great description, we are thinking about it a little bit more about what it means to be healthy, not just physical health, but the emotional health, relationship health, all the health, all those things that you just mentioned. But I really like that approach. And I really like the example that you shared about how that helps to drive the decision making in the company is does this make us healthier? And that's a it's a very simple question, but it's a powerful question. Is it okay? Is this a better or worse decision if you step back and think about it that way? So I really like that. Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. And I'll just interject yeah. too real quickly that when it comes to your values, I think the key is that as you set goals for the organization, they have to be tied to your values. Yes. And most values are driven by metrics, but not by values. And I think that's one of the greatest shortfalls organizationally that many experience is because they think that metrics bring value, but it's actually your value that brings the metrics. And we can't get that backwards. I, oh boy, I completely agree with that. That is such a powerful statement because too many times you're absolutely right. The, the values become the feel good, throw up on the wall so that we feel good about ourselves kind of an approach and they need to be driving decisions. And when we let the values really sink in and we proactively think about the values that we've established for the company, they will drive decisions and they help us to make better decisions and help us align to our values. Thank you so much for taking just an extra second to add that because that's a really important tip for all of our leaders out there to think about is proactively letting those values make those decisions. And that's why that's why we're asking the question, having this discussion about that. So, all right, well, question number three, uh, Dr. Randy, what is one tip that you have to help leaders find and then hire talent? I love this question. Um, and I love this rapid fire interchange because <laughs> this is a lot of fun. But here's the thing. Um, if you want to find and hire top talent, then you need to create the kind of culture within your organization that attracts that talent. And I think this is where many organizations fail. Because they go, they talk about going out and finding talent. They talk about recruiting. Sean, the best organizations I know, they don't recruit. They, they select. attract. Yeah, they, they select yeah. because because you know your culture is a powerful, powerful thing. And there's a lot of conversation going on in the market about culture, but but a lot of groups don't still quite get the impact and the power of a good, strong culture. But a culture needs to be like a magnet. It needs to both attract and repel. It needs to attract the right kind of people to come that align with the values of your organization. They believe in the cause. They want to be a part of the mission. They want to do good. And they, they feel like they can do it in an organization that's like yours. Uh, and they should also repel those people who don't align with those values. Right. So back to your point about being led by values values form what we call value centricity. When the values of the individual align with the values of the organization, then you can turn people loose to do what they're naturally inclined to do. You don't have to light a fire underneath them. You can fan the flame within them. So I think you want to attract that kind of talent. But then next, I think one of the secrets that I have learned as I've worked with organizations when it comes to, to tapping into that talent is in the process there are seven things that I outline in the book of Relationomics that I'm looking for in people that I hire. And so I won't go over seven. We don't have time, but I'll give you the first one. Okay. Yeah. They receive feedback. Well, mm. and so what I do in the hiring process is I always, I always offer an insight or challenge 
a particular point that person is making just to see how they react. Because I want to see, are they going to get defensive or are they going to stop and be reflective? Are they going to take that in? Are they going to listen to that? Or are they going to completely reject that and become um, adversarial in that conversation? Because I want to find out, is this person open to being challenged? And are they willing to reconsider their position if more information is added to the equation? Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. if someone doesn't receive feedback, well, that's a pretty good indication to me. They're going to be difficult to coach up. Right. And so I'll pass on that front. So I think trying to determine as quickly as possible, how coachable and how hungry that individual is, is, uh, is a key love it. to, you know, getting the best people in your team. Oh, that's great. I really like that because that's one that doesn't get brought up a lot is how well can the person receive feedback? And then of course that we, and, I, I promised myself every time that I'm not going to go too deep on a tangent, but it, it stimulates an interesting discussion that we'll leave to our viewers and listeners to kind of think about. But how, based on what Dr. Randy just talked about, what would you change as far as hiring and the interviewing process? How can you then pull out of that person? How can we see if they're going to receive feedback well? What would you do differently to, to change your hiring process to learn how to identify this example, at least, how, how well can they receive feedback? How would you do that? So that's a, a thought for the uh, for the audience to kind of think about. All right. Uh, question number four. How do you identify and develop strengths within your company? Uh, that's a simple one. I ask. I ask. You know, a that's lot great. of organizations, they make the mistake, I think, of trying to create a career path for people. Yeah. It's like, this is, this is what we envision for you. This is what we want to see you do. This is what you need to accomplish to get to the next step. But I think I like the idea of career crafting, not career pathing, but career crafting. So I want to ask the individual, what is that you'd like to do? Where do your passions lie? And this gets back to the principles of axiology. I wrote a book uh, entitled Remarkable. It talks about the principles of axiology. And one of the key principles of axiology is to continuously create value. You have to leverage your passion and your strengths to solve problems. And there's a lot of talk mm -hmm. in the market about pursuing your passion. There's a lot of discussion about leveraging and leaning into your strengths. But sometimes we miss the idea and the point that the, the reason we do that is not just for self-fulfillment, but we do that to solve a problem. Mm -hmm. So the question mm -hmm. I often ask people is, what problem would you like to solve? Because I want yeah. you to leverage your passion, what you really like to do. And I want you to leverage your strengths, what you do really, really well to solve a problem. And so I want you to think about what's the biggest problem that you see that you can solve. Because the bigger the problem you solve, the more value you create. And the more value you create, the more invaluable you become. And therefore, you begin to craft your own career. So I don't want to know where, you know, how can I discover something about you so that I can put you in the right place? I want you to tell me, what would you like to do? What's your objective? What are your, what are your hopes and your dreams and your aspirations? What problems do you want to solve? What value can you bring to the organization and then turn them loose to do what they do best. So oh, I love that. You ask them, what do you want to do? Yeah. It sounds so simple. And yet so few leaders will really take the time to do that, to just sit down and have a conversation and ask that question. I love that you brought that up. And I loved your phrase, uh, not career pathing, career crafting. I think that's a really good way to look at it. We're going to create a career path. We're not just, or a career for you based on what you want to do. I love that. I love that. All right. Our last question, the fun question for the day here. Got to get my hat on. It's time to talk about baseball a little bit here, being the Phillies fan that I am. All right. Well, Dr. Randy, do you have a baseball experience that you'd like to share with us? Well, I do. I mean, I've got, we live here in Atlanta. So I'm obviously a big supporter <laughs> of Braves, right? I mean, I have to be. Right. But, but but my story uh, that I think is, is kind of fun is a personal experience. When I was in the sixth grade, I played for our Little League All-Star team. And uh, it was an honor. It was a privilege. It was a lot of fun. But uh, in the All-Star game, Sean, I, I want you to know that, that you're speaking to someone who was, well, I'll just tell you, my first time up to bat, I hit a double and drove in two runs. Okay. Nice. My second time up to bat, 
I hit a home run, a solo home run, but you know, it scored us a point. So the third yeah. time I got like that, the opposing team walked me, and it was so honored that they thought <laughs> it was such a threat that they walked me. But here's the here's what I really want you to take away from that story. Not that it's purely self-aggrandizing, but I want you to know I was a phenomenal baseball player, but the problem was I peaked at the wrong time. My career peaked in the sixth grade. <laughs> <laughs> It was all downhill after that. So I have, I have nothing more to give. So the, the, the key is timing is everything. Uh, I, I wish I hadn't peaked until about 10 or 12 or 14 years later, but uh, I peaked way, way, way too early. But still, that's great. I love that you were uh, having such an impact that they walked you because you don't hear about that too much in, in the little league uh, level of play of intentionally walking a player because they just don't want to pitch to him. So that's impressive. Well, thank you so much for sharing that story. I just, I'm obviously a big baseball fan as people can see from behind listeners know that I've always been a big baseball fan. I love all sports, but baseball is my favorite. So thank you for sharing that story. And again, thank you, doctor, for taking time to be on the podcast today. How can people find you? Uh, it's real easy. Uh, our website where you can gather more information on, on our services and offerings is drrandyross.com. Just DR, no period, Randy Ross. Dot com and there you'll see all kinds of information and if you're interested in books you can order them there or, or find out where you can order them uh, and by the way one more pitch for remarkable our third edition uh comes out in april shortly after this podcast is going to air and so if people want to pick up a copy of that book i'd be honored fantastic well thank you for mentioning that and thanks again for joining us as a guest and thanks to all of our listeners and viewers we appreciate you tuning in every week to learn more about leadership and teams, we wish everybody a great day. Thank you. This is Sean Richards with the Team Engagement Podcast, where leaders of teams share their insights. For more ideas, go to teamengagementpodcast.com. We also invite you to follow or subscribe to our podcast wherever you may be listening or watching. Is your business thriving? Go to tbs-score.com to find out. Thanks for joining us today. Have a great day.